My name is Mark Gaster. I'm a partner here at Dorsey & Whitney. Uh, I've been here for 35 years now. Um, started my career uh, back in the early 80s, and one of my very first clients was a food packaging company, and uh, got me very interested in uh, food and food safety issues. I have a master's degree in public health, and um, it, uh, it's been a, a, an interesting ride for the last 35 years, and many changes, as all of you know. Um, we've got a great panel here uh, this morning. We're going to have uh, our topic is uh, farm to table and back to farm. But what we're going to be talking about are food recall issues and genomics and tracing and tracking and risk and risk management and, and uh, how companies uh, uh, might mitigate those risks. So let me just introduce the panel uh, quickly. Um, one housekeeping matter, you've got some green sheets. Uh, the tables, uh, fill them out. We, uh, we do have CLE credits if you need them for uh, the sessions today, so appreciate that. And, and any feedback you have, we, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so uh, the panel here is uh, uh, to my immediate left, Greg Thompson. Uh, Greg's a great friend and former colleague. He used to work at Dorsey, what, 20-plus more years ago, um, and I worked yeah. with him. Uh, previously, he was at FDA. I went from Dorsey over to the senior food uh, lawyer at Cargill, and now as the chief food lawyer at General Mills. Uh, Greg was on our panel last year. He's uh, very knowledgeable and entertaining, and um, we look forward to hearing his war stories. Uh, next to Greg is Mike Droke. Uh, Mike is a fantastic partner of mine out of our Seattle office. I've worked with him closely on a number of uh, food uh, matters. Um, if you uh, know the old adage, uh, you can uh, lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Well, Mike can make them drink. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the last is uh, Ryan Roth. Uh, Ryan is a senior vice president at Marsh McClellan. Uh, he works in the product recall space. Uh, he joined Marsh in 2010. Uh, he was part of their crisis management team and now helps companies manage food safety and recall risks. So um, our panel today is going to talk about uh, uh, food safety risks, um, genomics, which is uh, obviously currently in the news, and how risks can be managed. Um, everyone by now is familiar with FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, and you know the affirmative requirement under the law now to have preventive controls, and for companies to implement those preventive controls to manage food safety risks. Um, on this slide, let me just move to the next slide here. We've, uh, I've identified uh, a, a list of uh, techniques and practices that companies undertake to help manage uh, food safety risks. That, that list is growing. Um, so we're now going to hear about supplier verification and uh, root cause analysis work and uh, blockchain and, and genomics. Uh, and I think you're going to hear from the panel that you know, food safety is, is something that uh, is, uh, it's a scary thing. It, you know, it, it, it is very, very difficult to manage. And you can have the best of plants, the cleanest plant, and you can still have a food safety risk. And the interesting thing about pathogens is they don't discriminate. So you can have that clean plant, and yet you can still have, and you're going to hear war stories from our panel, uh, significant food safety risks. Uh, and I think with that, I'd like to, to turn it over to Greg for just a minute to talk about what food companies uh, and, and even what agencies are doing to advance the management of food safety risks. How companies, how are companies responding and how are regulators responding? And we talked a little bit earlier about future casting. What is that going to look like as we, as we progress? Thanks, Mark. I'll just say that um, if you want to become frightened about pathogens, go to food safety training, right? Go to some really good food safety training. So I, I always think that if I learn more about something, it'll make me more comfortable, understand how things are managed. By the way, you know, this slide that Mark put together, this is all right, uh, but this is really hard to do. So I had the opportunity recently to go to a three-day food safety training at Ecolab, and I found out things that I didn't even know were possible, right, that, that happened. But, you know, one of the people I met there, one of the instructors, um, he referred to himself as a doctor of turdology, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and he had been with them for 40 years, and I was thinking, okay, this is going to be interesting, right? Um, and he had this nice framed um, set of different turds from, like, roaches and flies and, 
he could go into a plant and he could see these things and know exactly where they came from, right? Um, and so just for starters, I know that FDA focuses on pests and keeping pests out of plant is one of their number one violations that they cite people for. And after listening to this guy, I firmly understand why that is. So he said, just for kicks, because this is a, you know, a pest guy, he took a Petri dish, you know, like the size of a hockey puck, it's got some agar in there, and he had a cockroach just walk across it, and he took the cockroach out, and then he just set it aside, and it bloomed with bacteria right where the steps were across it. I mean, these things, these bugs just trans, they just carry all these insects and rats and rodents, they just carry this stuff into plants. I mean, you don't want that anywhere near your food, but that's what's happening. And so, you know, I spent three days actually with like our sanitation people at plants going through this training um, and hearing more stories and, and listening to things. And, you know, plus I've heard them before. Uh, this is what keeps me up at night um, because, you know, what I knew before is, you know, there's a couple of questions. How do pathogens, you know, where do they come from, right? They come from raw materials, employees, and the environment. And what do they need to grow once they get in the plant? They need food. Food plants all have food. They need water and they need time. And that's it, right? So you imagine these things, you can't keep them out. They get in and then they find their little niche and then they start growing. And then you don't know what it is. So you have to have really robust programs across the board on this. Um, and I'll just tell you like one interesting story, like you try to anticipate where these things are coming from, right? You want to keep the bugs out for sure, right? So there was this one plant that was really buttoned up and uh, they kept finding salmonella and they couldn't figure it out and they're swabbing and they clean and they're swabbing again and doing their vector swabbing to try to trace where this is coming from. And they're bringing in experts and they cannot find it. And then one day they finally see what, what, what was happening and they did not anticipate this. There was one employee who found some back stairwell to the roof and he liked to go out onto the roof for his smoking breaks. Well, you can imagine the roof is not like clean. Birds hang out out there. There's puddles, there's all kinds of junk. And he was just tracking it right back down into the plant from the roof, right? But that wasn't something that people saw coming, right? And so those are the kind of things that, you know, even even when you have the best people with the great resources and you're anticipating, you just may not see these things. And then they get in there and then you have a problem, so. You know, just to come in along those lines from an outside provider perspective, you know, we have a, uh, the privilege really of, of walking through lots of plants. I've probably walked through hundreds, uh, 100 plants at least of all different kinds, whether it's meat packing and, and you know, uh, leafy green, vegetable, broccoli and the like. And if you, I encourage the members of the audience to do this every once in a while, just walk through one of your supplier plants uh, and, and follow the product. So ask the person that is giving you the tour to say, okay, bring it in and then, you know, where does the product enter the facility and walk it all the way through to when it goes out and look at it from the perspective of what can get into it that is unintended. So, you know, what happens, at, as you said, on the smoke break or the lunchroom and what's the cleanliness that happens as they go in and out of the facility and the like. And it's, it's such an enormous job. Uh, from an operations perspective, uh, you know, we, we recognize people work on really super thin margins uh, and, uh, you know, they're trying to be as efficient as they can. Uh, and, you know, with daily production requirements, it's hard to keep up the vigilance like, like anything in your, in your life. So uh, having that tour is, is really critical, I think. And how does this all play out in the context of food safety and food safety recalls? Like, obviously, we've seen a significant uptick in food recalls, uh, fresh foods, uh, whether it's lettuce or cut melons, uh, processed foods, ready-to-eat foods, grain supplies. Um, you know, how are companies able to manage this? You say, well, you've got this long list of food safety management techniques, whether it's uh, GMPs or, or uh, quality controls or swabathons. Um, you know, nothing's 100%. So how, in our, in, you know, the collective experience of the panel here, how are companies managing this and what is the agencies doing in regards to, you know, food safety risks? Are they just simply evaluating your quality controls, your sanitation, your procedures? Is there anything, you know, proactive that the agencies are pushing or are we all kind of just uh, swimming out there and, uh, and uh, there's not a clear direction on how and where this is gonna head? 
I'll jump in to start. Um, one of the things that we're seeing on, on the, the side from the manufacturers dealing with government agencies and state agencies is that it kind of varies depending on the agency, state, and, you know, who has the power. We've, we've seen some instances where, um, you know, USDA is in the plant on a daily basis, but the uh, FDA comes in and unannounced, and now who, who has the jurisdiction over, you know, mandating or is forcing a recall in, in some instances or shutting down a plant? So I think that that's one thing that we see a lot of uncertainty, and it's just untested at this point. So, yeah, I think I would I would comment that um, I, I think a lot of the innovations being driven from the uh, the customer side and the customer I don't necessarily mean the end user consumer I mean the people who are the the largest person in the chain uh, who has the most resources to defend a claim because you know the way the food safety laws work the liability is going to flow all the way through uh, the chain every person who touches it after it's been an infected product is potentially on the hook for claims and the value of those claims can be very very significant uh, the plaintiff's bar is very sophisticated uh, I was talking to one of my friends Sam Terzic here in the audience about uh, some folks out in our uh, neck of the woods in Seattle that have a, a law firm that employs epidemiologists uh, and nurses and the like uh, to do the science behind uh, the, the um, uh, cases themselves. And so what happens is the larger players are saying, listen, this is what we're going to require uh, as part of your own food safety programs and doing some of that innovation themselves. So you know, I've had examples I've discussed of, of innovations like uh, doing electrostatic um, uh, activation of meat products so that you can get things that will kill the bacteria into the nooks and crannies. You know, how do you, how do you clean an organic strawberry? It's very difficult. Uh, and so, you know, companies are having to innovate how they, how they do that to keep the pathogens out to the extent that that's possible, recognizing that 100% compliance has to be the goal, uh, but it may not be achievable. Well, that's a nice segue into the next slide, which is a discussion about whole genome sequencing. You've all heard of WGS by now. Um, you know, it is uh, the FDA's new tool. Maybe not so new, new, but it, you know, it has the ability to uncover the complete DNA profile of a pathogen. And with that, it's uh, akin to a fingerprint. And so the ability now for science to identify and then track back and compare pathogens from the plant or from the farm to the plant to the consumer is, is, has increased and is only going to continue to increase. And I think we heard earlier, sometimes the science outpaces the reality of how companies are going to manage um, whole genome sequencing and this tool. It can be a sword and it can be a shield. And from a legal liability perspective, from a risk management perspective, uh, companies are just now starting to think about how do we use, how should we use, what are the uses of whole genome sequencing? Um, do I want to do it? Should I test? Do I have to test now? Where I didn't do Twabathons two or three years ago, now do I want to do them because FDA can come in and do it and they can, they can match me up with uh, you know, uh, a plant in Iowa and a outbreak in, you know, Tennessee. Um, and I think the, the, the question for the panel, and, and there's not a good answer to this right now, at least from a legal perspective, is how are companies dealing with whole genome sequencing and what are the implications? I'll give you one war story and then I'll let the, the panel chime in. So. Um, client had uh, a, a worker who was responsible for taking samples and doing the testing, sending the samples off to the lab uh, for, uh, you know, pathogen testing before a product went out the door. Um, new person comes in, he's uh, new to the job of taking samples, uh, takes the sample from the bin, puts it in the lab pack, goes, reaches into his pocket, pulls out a pen from his pocket marks the samples with the pen, sends it off to the lab, lab comes back, bingo, right, got a positive hit, right? 
All right, so you, you do your root cause analysis. This is before whole genome sequencing, and you evaluate, all right, this looks like the root cause. We're going to change our practices. You know, fortunately, we had a hold procedure so that we didn't send anything out to consumers before the test came back. Uh, you know, you might have a hot room. You might whatever you're doing to help evaluate, evaluate and manage the risk. Now, in comes FDA. Now, not in this particular case, but they come in, let's just say, and they doubt do swabbing. And they find the pen, they find the guy's pocket or whatever, and the whole genome sequencing comes back and it's not the guy. Right? Now, you're at a loss. You've already made your determination. You've already released product. You've already decided, well, we knew what our root cause was. And now, six months, nine months, a year later, you come in and whole genome sequencing has the ability to say, no, it wasn't X. It was really Y. It was your drain. And now you've got thousands and tons of product that's out in the marketplace, and what do you do about that? That's the power of whole genome sequencing, but it's also the risk of whole genome sequencing. And as an industry, we have to evaluate how we're going to manage that. And so I'm going to throw the question open to the panel here about what we foresee, not necessarily what our companies are doing, but what do we foresee uh, on the use of whole genome sequencing? How is it going to be implemented? What are the benefits? What are the risks that you see? Um, this, is a, this is going to be a very, very significant advancement in food safety, and um, I, I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I'm going to throw it open to the panel here. Well, <clears throat> I'll jump in. So one, one very practical issue that you or your clients might face is if you're involved in a recall and it involves a pathogen and you do some additional testing to try to get the scope of the recall worked out and you get a positive, the first thing FDA is going to ask you is if you will share your isolate from your test with them. Okay, so the isolate is the actual bug that the laboratory has grown in a Petri dish. And the law doesn't say you have to share it with FDA, but if you give it to them, you know for sure they're going to do the whole genome sequencing on it, they're going to run it through their databases, and they're going to find something, right? And so, I mean, that's, that's a real difficult issue because when you're dealing with an FDA, especially with a recall, you know, it's very sensitive. You don't want to tick them off, and they're like, we would like to see the, we want you to share those isolates. You want, you know, put them in a test tube, put them on ice, ship them to us, ship them to our lab. And you got to kind of decide, right? And that's a tough question because you, I mean, legally, I don't know. I've never sorted this out exactly. I don't think they have the legal authority to require you to do it, but you don't want to tick them off when you're trying to figure out the scope, work with them on the scope of recall. So that's, from a practical standpoint, this whole genome sequencing creates some headaches for people. But go so, ahead. So, so I was going to just ask you a question, though, Greg. Uh, exactly what is the whole genome sequencing that you're talking about? What's the actual process and what does it do? Okay, so look, um, I'm a poser here. I'm just a lawyer, right? I don't <laughs> understand this stuff. Gerardo I used to work with, now he's, he's head of food safety somewhere. He could answer some of these things, right? <laughs> he, like he's a scientist, he knows stuff. But, you know, I've listened to- You want me to come up if you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've listened to, you know, the FDA explain whole genome sequencing and how they do it. and. To the best that I can explain it is, you know, they take the bug, they put it into some piece of equipment, they probably break it apart, they map out, there are like two to three million base pairs of the DNA that each bacteria is going to have. Um, so you think of a, a twisted ladder like the DNA and every, every rung on the ladder is a base pair. And out of those two or three million base pairs, if there's less than 10 differences, They'll say it's the exact bug, and then they're going to say, you know, you're done. Um, and so that's the hard thing. So that's what they do. And so here's, for example, is a warning letter, which was just issued this year. And they went in and they swabbed this plant and they found listeria in, um, you know, in various places. Um, here, an attachment to the conveyor belt near a table, a seam between something and a conveyor belt and the top of a conveyor belt, so that's a food contact surface. They take those positive listeria monocytogenes tests and they run them through their system, and lo and behold, so this is 2018, they found that um, there was a sample of a ham and cheese burrito from 2014 that had the exact same bug in it, right? And you're like, now what does that mean, right? Like, you can't probably recall that product because that product's done, I mean, People have eaten it. It's beyond its shelf life. But 
But it, this is what they can do with it, right? And what does it mean? Right? And yeah, unless it was frozen, in which case it oh. might still be out there, and there you, you go. still have an obligation to uh, do the, the recall. Well, and one of the big challenges is how do you bookend this? Now, how do you know where and how far to go back? And I mean, these are uh, very interesting questions. And I'm going to throw in, I'm going to play Hamlet for a minute, <laughs> you know? To test or not to test, that is the question. <laughs> and I, I, I think, you know, show of hands, I mean, how many, how many folks would be, you know, recommending that we have a, a whole genome sequencing testing program as part of our routine analysis? Anybody doing that? Is there anyone in the room, any company now that uh, wants to raise their hand and say, yeah, we're doing whole genome sequencing? Um, I don't know too many that do. On the other hand, right, um, a year or two or five from now, maybe that's going to be the norm. Um, because you can't, the genie's out. You can't stuff it back into the lamp. And the question's really going to be, how are we going to manage this? And the power of, let's see here, yeah, right there, the power of, of the WGS is that uh, you know, FDA now has this genome tracking database that has over 100,000 isolates that they've identified and that, that they've done the fingerprinting on, and that's only going to continue to grow. So they're going to be able to track and trace pathogens through this food supply. They're going to be able to evaluate claims, consumer claims, uh, or debunk them, I suppose. Depends on what side of the table you're on. Um, you know, how are your, are your supply chain side folks going to manage this? Your ingredient suppliers, are you now as a company going to be demanding that, you know, we have a whole series of additional testing on the, on the ingredient and the supply chain side? Um, and if there is a pathogen found in a plant, are you going to demand whole genome sequencing? Um, you know, are you going to have testing to verify then that that didn't get into your plant? I mean, the questions just continue to roll. And I'm sorry to say that there really aren't great answers right now. Um, and then you have the, as I said before, pathogens, they don't discriminate and they can change. They can morph. They're persistent. Um, uh, and so as an industry, I mean, there are real challenges on how uh, we are going to uh, manage that. And I guess I'm going to throw the question open to Mike here on the, both the the supply chain side, and also the downstream, the retailer. I mean, what are we going to be seeing, or what, what do you think we're going to be seeing from the marketplace in response to whole genome sequencing and some of these safety, food safety challenges? You know, I think uh, I, my, my experience has been largely in the kind of leafy green uh, from California. I grew up near Salinas, California, and ha have had many, uh, uh, you know, walks through, through the fields and the like. And, you know, part of the real challenge I think that everybody faces in the entire uh, chain is who do you find who has the technical skill uh, and capability to, to do the swabbing testing in the right way? It's a, uh, had many of my clients who had QA positions open for a very long time, uh, trying to fill with, with reasonably qualified people, very, very difficult. Um, uh, what I'm seeing on the retailer side is that there is an increasing uh, focus on requiring at least a base level of testing and test and hold, um, and and which could include the, um, maintaining at least a sample of certain kinds of product for a more extended period of time. And that's particularly hard in very perishable products. So if you've got something where the date code's applied when the, when the knife cut occurs and um, you know, it's it's really got to get out onto the um, into the uh, uh, food chain to, to be able to be there for the consumer to ultimately purchase. So that's one of the real struggles I think that the supplier groups are having is how to have something that's a viable, realistic, and fast enough um, process uh, with a cost factor that's going to be even possible uh, in the way that they operate. Um, you know, the other thing that I, I've I've spoken to several uh, retailer. Uh, clients uh, about that, that worries them is that if they reject the product, it's not like the product is necessarily destroyed at that point. It can be taken back, repurposed, resold. It goes back into the distribution uh, channel, uh, possibly under a different label, but uh, nonetheless, uh, if there's an issue, it still is out there. So uh, that's something that they're struggling with because if, the, if some of the product sneaks through and gets on a customer shelf, 
uh, at, a, at a retailer, and, uh, and that might have been clean, but uh, something that was a rejected product is sold elsewhere. Um, the FDA is going to try and use that tracing to trace it back to whoever's got the biggest pocket and the most capacity to um, uh, handle uh, claims and issues. And Greg, I know you've got some more war stories in regards to you know plant experiences, not your own, but just out there in the in the ether. You know whether it's birds flying off of trucks, but share with us. I mean, again, whole genome sequencing is going to open up this whole new world of ability to track and trace. And you know, companies should expect the unexpected. But how far do we take that? Well, like I'll I'll start with sort of the end of your question and go back to some of the stories. But here. Here's a story. Like this is this is a true story of a company that was in a recall situation. So, um, you know, I work for General Mills. We're part of a trade association of other companies. So we share our stories about you know working with FDA. So I get to hear a lot of them. Um, one of them, the company shared an isolate with FDA from a recall. So they took a test of, of their product and they got a positive and they shared it with FDA because FDA asked them. FDA put it into their database. And FDA said five years ago, someone got sick from that exact bacteria, all right? Like, I don't know what you liability guys think about that, but like, that's a little frightening. So like, it was one person. So this person apparently went to the hospital, you know, they took the sample, they, were, they did the whole genome sequencing, they put it in the database, and it just sat there, and, it was, and that person was the only person with that bug at the time, so it wasn't an outbreak. So nobody investigated it further than that. And now, you know, five years later, they're connecting a food company to a person's illness with whole genome sequencing. Like, I don't know. Is there a statute of limitations? I'm not a litigator. I mean, I don't know how this works, but that's, that seems to me like a real risk. Like, I don't know if FDA would then notify that person or whether this is kept confident. I, I don't know. But that, you know, that's, a, that's kind of a scary thing, right? And this stuff, you know, back to, you know, the war story question, sometimes it's just like the stories I hear, you just don't anticipate it. So, like, for example, I, was, I heard a story about this company, and they had, um, they had a conveyor belt, and it had a curve in the conveyor belt, and they were running, they had cheese running over it. I think it was grated cheese, and it was falling off the conveyor belt. So, you know, an engineer comes in, puts a nice plexiglass shield around the corner, and everything is going just fine around the corner, but stuff is getting stuck in, in between the conveyor belt and the plexiglass, and it's sitting there, and listeria starts to grow there, right? And then, you know, FDA comes in and tests it and finds listeria in it, right? And then you're, you know, then you're in trouble. So, I mean, these, the sad thing, like, and stuff you can't anticipate. So like I heard a story recently, you know, this company was all buttoned up and had a good job and their supplier backed up their 18 wheeler to unload some supplies. And you know, it's all sealed in their little dock. I don't know how this all works. They open up the back door and birds fly out right into the plant, right? Right, and so now you've got what, a plant with five story ceilings and maybe yeah. some catwalks around it and doesn't like guns in the facility, right? So what, you can't like just pull out a shotgun and start shooting, right? I mean, so what do you do? Now you're in like, now you're in a bad spot because birds are not good when it comes to pathogens. They tend to not follow toilet training. Like <laughs> you can't have like a kitty litter box for them and have them go do that. So, I mean, so, highly represented on the turd wall. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> From the doctor of turdology, he would, not, he would not think that was very favorable. So like, it's, it's that kind of stuff that happens that can get you in trouble. And you know, when FDA inspects, they only inspect every now and then, and whatever they see, they assume is going on all the time and much worse, right? Because if they're only in there once and they see something, they think they're missing a lot of other stuff, right? So they may tend to focus on it, mm -hmm. right? And they come in looking for this stuff. So when they do their swabathons, they make sure they're doing two to 300 swabs throughout your plant in the areas that they're pretty concerned about because they know it's really hard to find actually these pathogens because you can't see them, right? And you got to swab a lot. Um, but they know if they do 300, they're pretty confident that if it's there, they'll find it. But they only, but they don't need to find 50% or 20%. They find one, one. right? And that's right. it. And then, and then they're off to the races, right? Then you're getting, you know, then you're getting ridden up. So anyway, it's kind of frightening, isn't it? Anyway. Well, and I, I think this goes to bullet point four here on this slide, which is, all right, we now have all these new techniques. We've got our preventive controls. We've got our recall plans. We've got our GMPs. 
you have all the things that were on the first slide in terms of uh, the, the hot button ways that we might manage and mitigate risk, uh, and yet, you know, from a legal liability perspective, um, and from a management perspective, and even from an executive uh, perspective, does you know WGS now evolve into something that is, is imputed knowledge is uh, to the company and creating that kind of uh, if you don't test now and you have a problem and, and it turns out to be a systemic problem um, does that create a significant liability risk beyond just typical liability does it now you know address things like punitive damages and um, things that uh, you know companies uh, obviously are uh, are not wanting to uh, have uh, have happened to them so the other thing that Greg mentioned was uh, a, a, a case that you thought was long closed could be reopened you know we now find that uh, you know there's a match with a serotype from five years ago and now what about all that product that went out of your plant what do you do about that and so um, I, I I think that uh, the Unfortunately, the plaintiff's bar, those bringing claims against the food industry, are going to have a field day with a lot of these uh, uh, issues, and they're going to use them to their advantage. And uh, the question becomes, how do companies and how are companies going to manage the risk? What proactively can be done to respond to these risks? Um, you know, we heard earlier to this morning about um, merger and acquisition activities. Um, a lot of startups being purchased, and to me, and, and I'll throw it over to, to Ryan, but I think one of the biggest risk points for companies is the marrying of food safety cultures. So you have a big company, as Greg says, it's all buttoned up, you've got your procedures in place, and then you've got the new company, which you know doesn't have the resources to be able to attend to all of these uh, food safety risk preventive measures, and now you have this acquisition, and you've got this period of time when you're marrying these cultures. Uh, and to me, uh, from a client perspective, that's where I see some of the greatest risks. And when we're doing due diligence on acquisitions and we're trying to evaluate the purchase of a food company, um, these issues come front and center. And yet, ultimately, the business folks have to make a decision. Are we willing to take that risk? Do we want that technology? Do they want that innovation? And are we prepared to accept the you know, food safety risks that are that are potentially uh, uh, coming with that acquisition. And I guess I'll throw it over to uh, to Ryan to talk a little bit about uh, about that issue. Yeah, thank you. I, I think that we're seeing that a lot on the merger and acquisition side. And I know we're going to get into the insurance a little bit later, but that's a big area of concern for a lot of these insurance companies because there's a complete gray area between when a company is acquired and when are they going to be up to the the quality standards of that larger company that you know they are originally underwrote to um, in in the insurance policies there's usually an acquisition threshold that allows for companies to automatically be included in the coverage um, if they're acquired if they're under a certain amount of exposure sales revenue compared to what the the overall program was was based off of um, I think that that might be something that is scaled back. We have a few markets that have suffered a number of losses that are strictly on the private equity and merger and acquisition side that are now saying they're, they're stripping that out of their policy, saying we're not going to automatically include that until these companies can prove to us that we have the right people reviewing these quality plans, making sure they're up to par, or at least giving us a timeline that shows us when they'll be up to the, the appropriate standards. I, I, uh, I think we're going to see tremendous change uh, in the near term. Um, with things that you're going to hear about in, a, I think, the next panel, like blockchain and uh, you know, AI and um, Internet of Things, you know, at some point here, we're not too far away, I don't think, from having Alexa tell us that our refrigerator is not cold enough or our milk is beyond its best buy date or um, you know, it's time to throw out the can that you had in your pantry for the last five years. Um, you know, RF tracking is going gonna, is gonna to be available or is currently available. I think that, uh, you know, there's going to be tremendous uh, ongoing innovation and um, companies are going to be looking at embracing these tools to help manage the risk. Um, but, you know, it's a two-sided coin. You can manage that risk and you can also be subject to the risks attendant to 
and the liabilities attendant to it. So uh, stay tuned. I mean, it's, uh, it's been a wild ride. I think it's going to continue to be a wild ride. Um, so what are some of the common challenges? Um, you know, we, we, we all like zero tolerance, you know, in food safety for sure. We don't want pathogens in our food supply. And yet, um, you know, the, the reality is that, that that's just not practical. We're going to continue to see uh, food safety risks in the marketplace. Um, and we're going to continue to see marketplace pressures, uh, cost reductions and margin efficiencies versus risk management and risk mit mitigation. And companies are going to have a tug of war about where they're going to put their dollars. And, you know, as Greg and I have talked about many times, you know, uh, it's scary. It's very mm -hmm. scary. Um, do you roll the dice mm -hmm. and take the risk? Um, do you uh, put, put capital costs in play in motion at the risk of profits? Um, where does innovation fit into this? And our companies, I have clients right now that, you know, they have old plants. And uh, it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars for them to upgrade and, and innovate. And yet, if they don't do it, uh, how do they balance that with the liability risk that might be out there? Um, recall management is another one. And, and, and Mike, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, sort of the liabilities that, that arise from some of these common challenges. Uh, yeah, you know, just I, I was intrigued as we were preparing and talking about whole genomic sequencing, which of course is terrifying. Um, in that you have somebody, it's, it's retrospective, right? So you, you have somebody who's gotten injured, they uh, are tested, you know, they, there's a, a tracing process that goes back. Um, many of the recalls that you have are for mundane things. Uh, you know, there's a labeling issue, there's a, a problem with uh, an allergen that was, uh, you know, accidentally in the, the product. I've had a couple recently, a, a company that uh, had, had bought from one of their suppliers a box of chocolate chip cookies, and it turns out they were peanut butter chocolate chip cookies. And so, you know, that's a scary one. Uh, Mark and I worked on one where it was a, a test uh, product that had some egg in it, uh, and it was marked everywhere you could, big stickers and red wrapping, et cetera, but it was sent to a shipper uh, who, you know, got a, a purchase order for a certain uh, item number and they just weren't thinking and not reading or something or colorblind. I don't know what the problem was, but uh, they shipped some of it out. And so, you know, what, what happens is that, you know, I think employers and companies really need to be uh, to have a system in place that, that can, can manage it um, while in parallel with the production demands that are going on at the same time. Because if you're going to quarantine product, if you're going to be recalling it back, uh, reaching out through the tracing mechanisms uh, that you've got in place, it's got to happen very, very quickly. Uh, and then meanwhile, you, you've got to have a way to communicate with the customers who, when they hear about the, the recall, they get really nervous. You know, they go, oh, gosh, my tummy wasn't feeling well or my, my kids were sick last week and maybe it was this product. And so you have to have a way that's activated and activatable very quickly. So we've got, you know, a variety of different companies. A shout out mm -hmm. to the Gallagher Bassett team who has been working on a state of uh, the art way of communicating with the customers. Um, but having a way to to activate a, a recall program while your operations team is still out there producing, cleaning the plant, doing all the other things with, uh, you know, the limited resources that they have. Yeah, certainly we're going to be seeing changing market demands and the, these pressures are going to continue. I know, Greg, you were telling me about, uh, you know, it's not just a food safety issue. It can d delve into other areas of your business, even on the HR side. So you might have an employee who doesn't have the most sanitary conditions at home. And I know you've got a war story about that. Um, you know, give us a flavor for how this <laughs> might how this might implicate not just the food safety aspects of a company, but HR or other issues. Yeah, so for example, as I said, I was at this Ecolab three-day training, and one of the stories they told us was a company that had a problem with cockroaches. Um, and they finally figured out it, some of their employees had it in their homes and were just bringing it in their lunch and their clothes and whatever. And the company, like, so they couldn't just solve the problem, you know, by dealing with it in the plant. And they had to end up hiring Ecolab to go out to these people's houses because the people themselves didn't have an interest in it or didn't have the money or whatever it was. These are employees. And so, you know, that was the deal the way they finally got it fixed, right? 
Um, but you know, in terms of like common challenges, um, one interesting thing and was in the news this summer, Kellogg's Honey Smacks, right? I mean, you probably all heard they did a recall. The, the fascinating thing to me, and I don't know any of the inside, they're a competitor of ours and they don't want to tell me all the details of this and I haven't asked them. But if you just think of what is publicly available and you think about how this happened, one of the things they said was the product, their Honey Smacks, was made by a contractor. I don't know if you remember that, but that was in the news and that was also, FDA has that in their outbreak, outbreak write-up. Well, that's a supply chain issue that, you know, Mark's talking about. So what did they do? Presum I don't know the details, but presumably they had an issue, you know, they couldn't produce it themselves or they, you know, a capacity issue or whatever. They pick a, a I'm presuming a good contractor, right? I mean, a good contract manufacturer, I'm sure they audited it and they did all the right stuff. And it just turned out that this contract manufacturer had a salmonella problem in their plant that they didn't know about, right? And so, you know, it led to this outbreak. And, uh, and if I was a cal, I mean, you just don't see that stuff coming, right? You do the best you can to qualify your suppliers, but you have these, you know, these, these cost challenges and cost reductions and other things. And so you can't maybe build a new plant to make this stuff, you're gonna have someone else make it for you, and it just gets you in trouble. I mean, and the best you can do, you can never be perfect, right? I mean, you can never eliminate all risk around the supply chain, right? You know, I, I was listening to the opening presentation with some morbid fascination because what they were talking about is that you're gonna see a significant increase in the partnerships and outsourcing, co-packing and the like, and that means more touches, which means more complications in recall, which means more uh, challenges in control, and as I think one of the presenters said, it's as strong as the weakest link in the chain, and there's a lot of links in that chain, it just increases your risk factor. Uh, you know, and, and insurance can help with that, but you also need the process, it seems. I think even when you look at, you know, all of the members in that supply chain, usually, you know, more times than not, it's going to be the, the small pocket. It's always going to come back to that small pocket effect. So at the end of the day, if you're the large food manufacturer with the big brand name, that's what you want to protect. And, and the one thing that I, I did want to talk about is the, the difference between the way people view food, you know, recalls and contaminations versus your typical everyday consumer goods. If someone gets a phone or, you know, an email from Apple saying your phone is defective or Samsung, you're, you're, they're catching fire, what is the, the remedy? They're going to send you a brand new phone. And I would think everyone in this room would probably be pretty excited about that. Um, on the food side, there's a good chance that you're never going to eat that at that restaurant or buy that product again for six to 12 months. So the, the brand damage effect on that can be drastic in that instance. Well, and uh, as we kind of wrap up the last to 10 minutes and leave some time for questions, I, I, it shouldn't be all gloom and doom. I mean, uh, obviously, we're, we're, we're uh, working in an industry that's going to continue to supply food to the population and, um, and is going to work hard to manage risk. And um, one of the things that uh, is out there to manage risk is insurance. I mean, I, I firmly believe that uh, WGS is a game changer. And, um, you know, with an increasing number of food recalls, um, that trend continuing, global implications that, that, that cross borders, um, you know, insurance is going to be a significant part of the risk mitigation tools that you have. And so, uh, Ryan, maybe you can give us an insurance update. What's happening in the market? How are the markets, the insurance markets responding? What uh, What's available for companies? Um, what's new and trending at this sure. point? Really what's happening right now in the marketplace is that, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was very select few players in this space. And, and what we've seen is that a lot of times when we talk to, to food manufacturers and, and ingredient suppliers about this risk, we would talk about, did you see this instance in the news? And it was an example of something that would give rise to a claim. We have more and more buyers, and we're probably growing by 20 to 30% every year of new buyers into this space. Um, I would say definitely of the, the top 25 food manufacturers, you know, 18 to 20, 20 of them are purchasing the coverage in some capacity. Uh, 
what I will say is, is that the real untapped area is that middle market and the smaller food manufacturers, which is where those losses are coming from. It's an, it's an untapped, it's probably 10 to 20% that actually are aware of it, and it becomes a, a budgeting factor. Um, we're having more losses in the marketplace now because we have more buyers, and a lot of those examples that we're talking about are in our, in our marketplace. And it's not limited to just one specific you know, area of the food manufacturing. It could be ingredients, it could be restaurant chains, it can be uh, meat, it can be eggs, I mean, lettuce, it, it's all over, it spans everywhere. Um, carriers are concerned with shelf life, especially on the frozen food aspect. And you know they do ask a lot of the questions as it pertains to how often are you testing? You know, what is the cleaning procedures on these? You know, listening to a lot of the, my fellow panelists up here about the amount of plant tours that they go on, I go on a number as well. And, and those are the questions that underwriters are really digging into is, tell me how often this is being cleaning and what is the full breakdown of the machinery? You know, food, food contact services used to be the only thing that we were testing. Now we're testing inside of drains and pipes and, you know, we're breaking down things to a, a vast degree because of the this, exactly what we're talking about. This this WGS is changing everything in where we can trace back the root cause, and it's going to cause more and more of these recalls. And it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes it's going to help shift the blame to maybe one of your suppliers downstream, and other times it might limit you to an instance where we're talking about. Now, all of a sudden, you're on the hook for something that occurred five years ago. Now, do you think that that customer can remember what product they consumed from your, from your company five years ago? I, I don't remember what I ate last week. So, I, you know, I, I think that can be, be difficult. Um, the, the, the insurance market has definitely evolved drastically uh, over the, you know, it, it's 30 plus years that it's been in existence. It started as strictly an intentional malicious product tampering type product, and it's evolved to um, you know the unintentional, which is what we're all talking about today. No one's intentionally finding listeria or, or putting listeria or salmonella in, in the products. It's inherent. It's in all of our plants, whether you like it or not. And you know, zero tolerance is is a great idea, but at the end of the day, it's still going to pop up. Um, understanding that third party aspect of what you can be liable for um, or what someone else can be causing you um, is, is also a huge thing to, to get an understanding on. So, um, you know, especially when it comes to ingredients, you know, that ingredient risk that, that you provide to a, a large food manufacturer can, can cost a hundred times what the value of that product was to you. So, you know, understanding the, the difference between the loss that you incur as the food manufacturer or the insured versus what that third party you can be on the hook and liable for. We've seen many instances where, you know, these big box chains are coming back and they're saying to you, um, you know, you caused me a loss for the contract manufacturing that we talked about earlier uh, for making the peanut butter for me. Now I've also got to hold you responsible for my bread sales, my jelly sales, what, all the complementary items that are coming along with that. And, you know, these, these losses balloon up. How negotiable are these insurance vehicles in terms of language, in terms of coverage? Um, what's the, you know, where, where, where's that market headed? I think that, you know, there's a lot of change around the triggers. What we're talking about on this slide here are really the losses that you can suffer. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it started as a malicious product tampering type policy to begin with. And then there was just malicious product tampering, accidental contamination, and extortion. Now today, you can get product refusal, intentionally impaired ingredients, uh, adverse publicity, you know, news stories alleging you to a contamination that quite honestly isn't true. And, and what we're really seeing a lot of uptick in when we talk about this testing is false positives. And that's something that I wish I had a better answer for you as to what the insurance solution is, is but it's still an unknown and, and an untested 
world right now. And carriers are constantly adapting their form to kind of you know learn. It's always what you're not thinking of that that's going to come into this claim situation. We, but, we, we call those testimonials. Right. right? <laughs> Don't dry your cat in the microwave. Please, <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> so. But I, I think that, you know, we still have an abundance of capacity in this marketplace. And while um, carriers are looking more to share and risk in terms of quota share opportunities and not, you know, put big limits out, because these losses are in some instances, dwarfing what your liability claims are. Um, the, the business interruption and reputational damage that you can suffer versus what you're being sued for, for that pain and suffering to, to the class action lawsuit is you know sometimes a fraction of what the overall contamination loss could be. So I, I think that we have a number of markets that are willing to think outside of the box and constantly evolve, and GMOs is another item that we mentioned earlier, you know, how do we address constant changes in, in GMOs and organics and things that maybe are labeled organic but shouldn't be? That's not going to cause potential bodily injury, which a lot of our policies always come to. So coming up with creative solutions is something that, you know, we, we definitely pride ourselves on working with the markets on. So, so I'd add a couple things from a practical perspective. Um, uh, because I think, uh, you know, first of all, a lot of times clients don't know what they have or don't have. Uh, they might think that the general liability policy covers uh, recalls, which it often does not, uh, or that the recall covers uh, things that, that, that aren't actually. So I'll give you a, like, a, a, an interesting data point. To, uh, you'd mentioned uh, communicating, you get a letter from uh, uh, Samsung about a, a, a phone. Uh, it costs about $1.25 per customer to send that letter, just to send it, not counting getting the information back and the like. So you, you add up the number of people who can get a, who, who have potentially purchased the product, just getting information to them is very expensive and, uh, and time consuming. So you need to automate that. Uh, and, you know, to keep the cost factors down, and then I think, frankly, look at your insurance coverage is to say, you know, what, what could potentially be covered? What do I want to at least know how, what I'm spending on so I can get to the retention as, you know, efficiently as possible? Uh, you would mentioned third-party uh, recall costs. If you are uh, manufacturing an ingredient that's uh, put into another product, uh, your little teeny spice, uh, you know, added into another larger product could invoke a recall that's much broader than, than what the manufacturer of that spice thinks might be possible. And so making sure that your, your brokers are aware of how your product's actually being used is really important because you don't want there to be, you want to increase your chances of the inevitable fight uh, over coverage. Uh, you know, by putting them on notice, by putting the carriers on notice of the product itself. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's 100% correct. The, uh, uh, the you know, there's the fight that you have in the market. Uh, Jane's telling me we have five minutes, so we'll open up for questions in a minute. But there's the fight you're going to have in the market with claims um, relating to uh, food safety issues and recalls, um, and then there may be fights that you're going to have uh, with your insurance carrier in regards to the scope and extent of coverage. And, um, you know, I'm finding, uh, I've been involved in a couple of recent litigations in, 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 in involving insurance coverage. Uh, we're finding that, uh, you know, the carriers are going to parse that language pretty carefully, and they're going to look for ways that they, uh, that they might avoid a claim or uh, minimize the risk to the carrier or to uh, their exposure. Uh, and it's oftentimes in, 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 in you know, being uh, advanced in ways that you just didn't anticipate when you procured the policy. And I think WGS is one of those issues. I mean, we talked and heard earlier about, you know, being able to go back five years. And maybe there's imputed knowledge. And if there is imputed knowledge, you know, or you had a test, did you have to notify them five years ago? And if you didn't, does that throw out your coverage? I mean, there are, uh, you know, numerous ways that um, I think we're going to see these uh, issues and liability questions play out um, in the near term and over the long term. 
And uh, I think companies need to work very closely with uh, their legal counsel and, uh, and, and insurance risk managers to really help evaluate and how to mitigate that risk, and in addition to all the other tools. I mean, look, at it, it's, not, uh, it's not like that we, we do not have tools to manage risk. So in addition to insurance, you're going to continue to do all your preventive controls. You're going to continue to work hard on your sanitation. Um, you're going to incorporate uh, blockchain. You're going to incorporate AI. Um, you know, I've even had companies come to me and say, well, we, you know, don't have a kill step, and so uh, our contracts, we're not going to sell to you and our ingredient unless you have a kill step. And if you don't, you don't get our product, period. End of story. Um, and then, you know, the question then becomes, well, is the kill step sufficient? And, you know, does it really do what you think it's going to do? And should we be looking at other techniques or radiation? Uh, so, you know, again, I think that there's just this wide swath of, of challenges and also opportunities. And um, I think, uh, you know, professionals uh, in this area are going to be busy for quite some time to come. Uh, so I, I guess I'll throw it open to questions uh, from the panel or from the audience. Uh, anybody uh, have any thoughts on, uh, on presentation? Yeah, go ahead. With the food supply chain becoming global, how, what is your perspective on the complexity of, you know, that it's one thing to put all the policies and frameworks in place. How do you see that if your food supply is coming from third world country, Mexico or some other country, right? Um, or it's going there. Um, what, what is the panel's thought? Any thoughts? Um, for some of our clients that are global manufacturers, what we're seeing is that they're having to physically put someone there to implement their standard of quality control for a, for a lot of those suppliers. And unfortunately, there's no way around that to protect their brand and their product. So if that's what they have to do, in some instances, that's what they're going to have to do. Um, I know that I've got three clients in particular that recently have, have expanded you know, teams in Mexico and China and, and different that, that they have U.S. or European uh, employees that are sitting in those countries or in, in those offices every day now. Just echoing that comment, I've stood at the border in Yuma and uh, watched the trucks go by. And it's it, <clears throat> if you're going to eat lettuce uh, in uh, November, it's going to come from that area and, and specifically from northern Mexico. So uh, that's what my clients have done as well, is they've implanted somebody who's an employee of the company to oversee and manage, uh, which is, creates its own complications, but that's what they do. Yeah, question. Just have a question and an additional comment, if you can, on the, on the fact that the food manufacturing industry is made up of a lot of uh, old facilities, legacy facilities that were built 30 plus years ago, and they were not built with food safety in mind, right? And so they still produce a lot of our food. And, and how do you see the risk management, you know, like insurance and, and other tools, you know, in, in those kind of facilities versus newer facilities? It's an excellent question. Um, just to repeat, uh, we've got uh, legacy facilities that weren't and, and didn't don't meet current uh, food safety or sanitation procedures and what can companies do or how are they managing their risk. Um, I, I, I think uh, I've got a client right now that is facing those very challenges um, and they're balancing capital costs versus uh, um, the market. Um, they're looking at what other risk management tools they can put in place. They're certainly trying to beef up their sanitation and their, proceeding, pr their procedures. Uh, the question got raised with me and, you know, should we be testing? And if we test and find, what do we do? Uh, how do we manage that? Do we have to shut down our operation, clean, and then to retest? And now, you know, what if we've got a resistant strain that we can't get rid of? So there's very, very significant challenges in your question. And you're right, we do have a very, uh, there's, a, there's a significant legacy. Uh, 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 Exposure. Uh, yeah, that's right, of, of our, our, food, our food manufacturing facilities. And... I think companies uh, are, are really challenged by it because uh, there is this tug of war between, you know, the costs to deal with this. And you, I think we said it before, FDA's position is you, you really can't test your way into, into compliance. 
And so you really have to look at all of these risk management tools and, and try to incorporate them as best you can. And it becomes much more difficult, of course, if you're a smaller to mid-sized company where you, you just don't have the kind of resources that uh, some of the larger companies might have. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. I'll just add that sanitary design is obviously an issue, right? That's, that's what you're bringing up. There's another issue, too, which is when a company innovates and wants to produce new products or in a different way, they bring the engineers in and they start changing the equipment. And they're not focused on how well it can be cleaned. They're focused on how to make that equipment do what they want to do. And that creates further uh, sanitation issues. Well, uh, certainly after the uh, conference here, uh, track us down if you've got further questions or want to talk more. Our information is uh, contact information is in the book. Um, that wraps up this session. If you're going to participate in the blockchain uh, program, stay in this room. If you're going to participate in the organic GMO program, that's down the hall, down out the back and to your left, uh, the Seattle room. Uh, really appreciate uh, your attending, and uh, I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you.